dedicated to empowering you with information to make positive choices and be advocates for your overall well-being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. I'm Yvonne Donitz and this is Dr. Laura Chan. And today we're going to be talking about supplements and their safety. And this is an important topic because it's a $30 billion industry. $1.5 billion alone is spent on fish oil. Can you imagine that? So today we're going to address a lot of information. And Dr. Laura, I'm so delighted that you're here with me today because I really, let's talk about what are the most common supplements that people use. And vitamins are a part of supplements. They are. So they get lumped together. They do. So share with our audience, what are the most common ones? So you mentioned fish oil. That yes. is the most common one by far. Yes. Yes. Many people take fish oil thinking that it's going to be beneficial for their cardiovascular health. Mm. Um, probiotics, uh, like the bacteria that's in yogurt but in pill form, mm -hmm. that's a very commonly used supplement as well. Melatonin for sleep is commonly used. Um, glucosamine chondroitin. Many people uh, are concerned about joint, joint pain. That's the most common reason mm -hmm. people will choose to take that. Echinacea, an herb used, uh, typically it's promoted to help uh, get over a cold faster, help support your immune system. Um, coenzyme Q10 is another supplement that's used, often promoted for energy or for cardiovascular health. Ginseng, an herb thought to help with energy and focus, and ginkgo, another herb also for energy and focus. You know what's so interesting is that not only are billions of dollars being spent on supplements, but thousands upon thousands of dollars every year are being spent for ER visits for both prescription medications but as well as supplements. Absolutely. Which is scary. It is. So I, we're going to focus on supplements, but the one of the things that I would like people to remember related to their prescription medication is it's so important for you to tell your doctor what supplements that you're taking. One of the things that we know is visits to the ER related to prescription medications that sometimes people don't know the contraindications related to the combination mm -hmm. of prescriptions that they're taking. And sometimes they're coming from different doctors. So exactly. even if the doctors know these contraindications, they may not be aware that another doctor is going to prescribe something else. Exactly. So mm -hmm. one of the recommendations I always let my clients know is carry with you a card or a piece of paper mm -hmm. if it's, you take a lot. Mm -hmm. Bring it with you to each doctor that you go to. Right. And let them know all of the prescriptions that each of your doctors have prescribed. With the dose. With the dose, mm -hmm. exactly. As well as tell them about the supplements supplements Absolutely. that you're taking because many times that is not shared right. and that can have an effect. And I want to go back to my list of supplements and yes. also mention multivitamin and yes. calcium. Okay. Yeah, and vitamin D. And you I, know, calcium, I could have kept going. There's so many okay. that are so popular. And right now, calcium is being said to, uh, for a woman's perspective, that it's not needed as it's not it, what was it was said cracked before. up to be before. Yeah. So if things are changing, right. but that makes it even more important. With prescription medications, we have the FDA, mm -hmm. the Federal Drug Administration, right. and they have specific guidelines and regulations related to medications that are researched and become available for our public. Right. But when it comes to supplements, there are no guidelines. No. And that's what makes it a little scary. It is absolutely so, scary. So as a naturopathic physician, supplements are something that would you say you use more of than a regular doctor, a medical doctor would? I would because I'm, I'm trained in them. I get a lot of training in the safe use. Uh, and at my doctoral level training, I'm taught a lot about how to look for safety in them, how to make sure that you're looking for potential interactions with pharmaceuticals that someone's on. I'm making sure that someone is choosing um, high, very high quality and uh, that they're at the appropriate dose for their weight. So I have a lot of training in them and I feel confident in using them very safely. But I share your concern about uh, supplements because most people don't have the amount of training that I do in their use and they're just pulling them off the shelves right. in you know, Walmart or Walgreens and, and that really concerns me. Yes, yeah. me too. And yeah. that's why it's so important that we're doing this today. Mm -hmm. So let's start with 
Where do you begin? Right. Where do you begin and why? I mean, we know that if people were eating well, yeah. They wouldn't need supplements. That's what I was going to say with where do you begin? Hopefully you don't even need a supplement. <laughs> we don't need right? to properly. If you're eating well and your healthy, stress is managed and you're exercising, and you don't need You them. shouldn't need a supplement. In fact, you could save a lot of money on supplements and buy good quality food right. in that regard, right? Right. But some people believe that by using supplements, it takes the place of food. And that's unfortunate, and I don't find that to be true. I don't think that's no. true at all. Mm -mm. Yeah, and it's it's too bad because food and lifestyle, stress management, those are the foundations of health. Supplements should be supplemental if something's not working well in that category, in that foundational area. And, and how so, might a person find out if it's not working that well? Would it come out in blood tests that maybe there's things that are lacking within the body that need could. more nutrients? For instance, a low vitamin D test can show a nutrient deficiency in that regard, or a low iron test can show that. Some um, are a little bit harder to test for. For instance, a woman with um, osteoporosis may not show low calcium on her actual blood test, but mm -hmm. that would come out in a bone scan. And then in an instance like that, some calcium supplementation is warranted a little bit more. Sure. But not for it's not necessarily the right thing for everybody across the board, and so that's where we need to be careful. Now, a number so. of people use supplements to lose weight. Yes, and weight that's loss. concerning to it's me. It's very concerning. I think we have to just admit there's no quick fix to yeah. this and that diet and exercise really is uh, the way to do it. And a true healthy lifestyle, yeah. which when, causes us to have to be motivated and to take the time to take good care of us. And I think a lot of people try to have a quick fix. Right. Give me a pill and make me perfectly healthy. Yeah. And I'll sit back and just enjoy life. These claims to health, and it's too good to be true if you're reading a label and it says, we'll help you drop 10 pounds in a week. That, that's where a red flag should go off and say, is, this might be too good to be true. I shouldn't, these claims aren't necessarily valid. So let's start with why we should be looking for a supplement to begin with, mm -hmm. and then how do we do it? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a hard question to answer because mm -hmm. there's so many different instances why someone might need a supplement. Um, vitamin D is a supplement that I'll recommend if I run someone's laboratory tests and find that the level is low. Uh, a probiotic is a supplement that I rec probably recommend most frequently. And why is um, that? Because I find it so useful. Because, And that's also a hard thing to get into the diet, especially if someone is lactose intolerant or has a difficulty with milk products. Yes. Because we think of yogurt as the main dietary source of probiotics. Yes. Um, other sources are ones we Americans don't have in our diet very much, like fermented sauerkraut and kimchi and things that um, just a lot of people don't, choose to have or want to have or even know are going to be beneficial for them. So the probiotic, what does it do in the body? So a probiotic is, is bacteria. It's right. friendly bacteria and it uh, populates the large intestine. And so there is a ton of research coming out around probiotics. We know without a doubt that they're helpful in cases of irritable bowel. Mm -hmm. um, they're also supportive for the immune system, we're learning. Mm -hmm. And there's even new research coming out that they're helpful for uh, brain-gut connections. So they're starting to be used in cases of things like ADD, ADHD, but the research is very preliminary mm -hmm. on that. Mostly, we have a lot of evidence to support their use in digestive health, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel, that kind of stuff. Now, some mm -hmm. people just jump into, just go into the store and say, and I'm just going to get a, they do their own combination of their supplements, right. thinking more is better than none. Right, or, right. You know, so they're picking and choosing. Or, or a good example of that is people, many people have heard that you should take a probiotic after you're on an antibiotic. Right. Because antibiotic kills the bacteria that's causing you to be sick, but also the good bacteria that's in your colon. So it's great news that many people are aware of this, and so they might go out and get themselves one, but they might get the totally wrong dose, or a dose that's just not going to help repopulate and counterbalance what the antibiotic did. So I, I am concerned that there's not enough awareness around appropriate dosing, or there's the quality control issue where people might go to you know, a store and buy a probiotic, pull it off the shelf, but that might have been a probiotic that when you test it, isn't active at all and um, 
and it's really anyone's guess when you walk into some of those stores. So it's hard to know, unless you really take a lot of time to educate yourself in this, which ones are going to be good at, at the right dose and which ones are just a waste of money. So that would be the same thing for vitamins mm -hmm. or any other supplements, which brings us to how do we read labels to know what's in the supplement and what's the difference between the different brands? Right. How do we educate ourselves? Right, that's a great question. So the first and foremost concern that I have is about safety, making sure that what's in labeled in the supplements is actually what's in there. There was a huge uh, news article and uh, all this news on TV that came out within the past year that someone had gone into, I think it was Walmart and GNC and Walgreens, pulled some supplements off the shelf and yeah. tested it to Correct. see if it actually contained what the label said and found that most of them don't, and exactly. that's frightening. It is frightening. But, you know, one bad apple doesn't spoil the whole bunch, so to speak, and so there are some great quality companies out there that really do make sure that what's on their label is exactly what's in the product. So, so how can a consumer learn about that? Yep, so one of my favorite websites to look into this uh, is called consumerlab.com. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, it's not a free website. It is $39 to become a member of this website. But they do have a free newsletter. They do have a free newsletter, and they have a lot of excellent information they about do. Um, what the supplements have been used for and researched for. So is there validated evidence to show whether um, melatonin is useful for this or is fish oil actually useful for heart disease? There is as much evidence as possible that's available as on this website. And then they also have tested a variety of different brands and they have seen is you know, is what the company says on the label actually in the product? Is it still fresh? Has it gone, you know, gone bad? Is it potent? Mm. And so they test it and they'll tell you which brands have met their criteria. So it's a third party that's testing these supplements. So there's not that conflict of interest. There's, their interest is public safety, which is ex excellent. So. I brought some um, labels that I want to show Absolutely. to our, our show audience. Show it right to the camera. Yep. <laughs> so, if you some products are going to have this Consumer Labs logo on them, and if they do, then this company, Consumer Labs, has tested them independently and given them their stamp of approval, saying this company has met our criteria. What's in the label is what's uh, also in the supplements. Now, there are two other companies that also independently test products and make sure that what's in the label is in the product. One is called the United States Pharmacopeia, and this is their label here. And if you find a product on the shelf that has this label, you can trust that it has been independently tested for safety, quality, and accuracy of the label. A third company that also does this is called NSF. They used to be the National Sanitation Foundation, but they don't go by that name anymore, but they kept the acronym. NSF, very similar label. Uh, you can look for these. It's, now, it's not a perfect system. It's confusing because some companies, the whole company has been approved by NSF. So every product that company puts out is considered safe but they don't necessarily have the NSF label on their bottle. So it takes someone to do a lot of digging and research and really see, um, is this company good or is it just this one product from that company? So it's a hard thing to find out, but a good place to start is, does the bottle that I'm holding in my hand as I'm in the line or in the supplement shop, does it have this label? That's a good place to start. So. Just to clarify a little more, mm -hmm. all these businesses mm -hmm. who are in the business of researching mm -hmm. this, the quality of the supplements have particular criteria. Mm -hmm. Are they all independently operating with no money going to them related to any of the companies in the business of supplements? Correct. United States Pharmacopeia and NSF are not-for-profit companies. Mm -hmm. Um, consumer Lab is a for-profit company. They earn their money through consumers like you and me who purchase the $39 access to their website. Um, and then also companies uh, will pay them when they've met their quality standards to be able to put their uh, label on their product. But they are not selling these products, so they're not making money from that perspective.
Very interesting. There is a website that's useful that does sell the products, but they um, sell them from a variety of different um, vendors of all sorts. This uh, website is called labdoor.com, mm. and they've also independently tested these products, and they give them a rating of A, A minus, B plus, and they explain why. So you might go and say, well, I want a vitamin C. I'm not sure which vitamin C to get. You go to labdoor.com and it has ranked from independent testing their vitamin C that they find useful. They also sell it from that website. So they independently rank it based on quality control, but they, that uh, website does make money from sales. So labdoor.com. Mm -hmm. Now the items that they have on their website though, are they all A quality Types of supplements? No, you can buy a, a D minus a supplement you if you want. You have wanted. to be very careful. So yep. they'll have that it'll, too. It'll be labeled as D minus. Got it. So, it's so the consumer obvious. beware with all of this. Yeah. And be educated and learn to really go after the information. Right. But also to repeat what you said is that just because people are selling supplements doesn't mean that you need supplements. Exactly. Exactly. So you That's really need to listen point. to your body and listen to what's going on, work with your doctor, and find out what is the most important addition that you need to make to the things that you eat right. to have. Now, generally speaking, many people have a multivitamin. Yes. Now, are all multivitamins alike? No. Okay, so talk to us about that, because when you think of the common household, a lot of them may have multivitamins. Right, and what I picture most commonly in households are the Flintstones vitamins for kids. Right. And then probably a Centrum or something for adults sitting on the counter. I remember even when I was a kid, we had the Flintstones vitamins. And they are candy, basically. They have a lot of sugar in them. Um, those types of children's vitamins just are... I'm not a fan. I'd rather a kid eat some vegetables and some fruit and get their nutrients that way. Um, but the gummy vitamins, the sugary vitamins, they're just, in my opinion, they're not worthwhile. So yeah. for uh, parents who want to give vitamins to their children, again, what would be the best way for them to find the best product? To so give them? if they do want to give vitamins, and generally multivitamins are safe, mm -hmm. generally some of them might have much higher values of certain nutrients in it than what's necessary, and that's where I say, well, let's just eat well instead. Um, so if you want to go, you can go to those websites, consumerlab.com, labdoor.com. You can look for these labels and you can see, and make sure that you're reading the label closely. Is this for children between the ages of four and 12, or is it approved for children below the age of three? You know, you want to make sure that you're meeting the criteria appropriately. So you also mentioned Centrum on the other uh, mm -hmm. plane related yes. to adults. Thanks for going back yes. to that. Uh, one thing that concerns me about some of these companies that are mass produced is they'll put a lot of fillers in them. So uh, you can read the label and you'll find that there's just a lot of what would be a common stuff filler? in there. So things like binding agent, something that holds it together, so mm -hmm. that makes it look like a tablet, something like that. Yeah. Or some of them might contain things like uh, gluten as a binding agent. And mm -hmm. some people are very sensitive to gluten and they need to be on a gluten-free diet. They might not be aware that their supplement has a glutinous binding agent. And I don't know if Centrum is gluten-free or not. I'm not trying to make an yep. accusation there. I'm just Surely. They're a common brand, so they came to mind. Yeah. yeah. A little while ago, uh, uh, maybe about a year, year and a half ago, um, Chronicle, which is a program that's on mm -hmm. our New Hampshire stations, did a whole interview about a company called um, Mega Foods. Mm -hmm. And in that, they showed Mega Foods and how they have been growing, and they're a New Hampshire based company, and that everything that they use is from real food yeah. without any fillers. What are your thoughts about that? I found that to be a very really compelling like show and was mm -hmm. just very excited that we had such a business in New Hampshire and that a lot of people still don't know about it. I really like Mega Foods. I think they're a very good company. Mm -hmm. I don't have any association with them, so no. I'm not endorsing them right. in that regard. But exactly. just from what I know about them, uh, they do a whole foods-based type of multivitamin. And also, I can speak from having been on the Consumer Labs website and the Lab Door website, they get good rankings. So that's important. But that's so important. the reason why I bring that up, one, because it's a New Hampshire company, which is wonderful when you have something so mm -hmm. excellent here, but that there are, in fact, 
companies that do make vitamins mm -hmm. and supplements that actually have real food in them. Yep, and they and don't have fillers. Yes, and don't have other things. So it's out there. A lot of people get concerned. Well, how do I know? What do I do? What do I look right. for? That it actually does exist. It that does. You just have to look a little further. Yep. But once you do you'll have a good source yeah. to use. Check out labdoor.com, check out Consumer Labs. They will guide you towards brands. And, uh, and that's nice because they're neutral. You know, they're not saying, well, I'm affiliated with this company because I'm getting paid. They're just, Labdoor, for instance, is just kind of a shop. You know, whatever brand meets their criteria, then Surely. they'll open it for sale And in it's that important regard. to look at that because, mm -hmm. I mean, the other interesting thing is that so many people that have um, no necessarily knowledge in the medical field or whatever are getting involved in selling supplements. Yeah, that's from a variety very, of different that's people. Very alarming to me as well because yeah. they really don't know. They just learn what is being told to them from the people who are trying to sell it as to what to tell people, and some right. of them are are reading in a sense kind of scripts that they learn about yeah. what to say, but there may not be exact research. Or they might be a rep for that company. You know, it's important to ask whoever's selling you your product if they're making money from selling it or if they're affiliated with that company. So it's important to, to follow that trail because you want to make sure there's no big conflict of interest in that regard. That's true. And there are five big and important questions to ask mm -hmm. about supplements that mm -hmm. I'd like to go over with our listening audience because it's important that you ask about this. And the first one is, has the product triggered any health warnings or sanctions? Mm -hmm. That's really important. Yeah. How would they go about doing that? You can they... go to the FDA website. Exactly. The FDA website has that information. If some ephedra is an example of that, that yeah. was used in most weight loss supplements. Mm -hmm. And it, has, it finally got pulled out of products because it triggered too many warnings, too many health problems. So you can go to the FDA website. You can put in their search bar the name of an herb or a supplement and see if it's triggered any warnings. Very okay. good. The next mm -hmm. question would be, mm -hmm. has the product been tested by independent labs? Which goes to your point about the consumer lab. Yep. Dot com, the NSF. NSF. And USP. And USP dot com. Mm -hmm. Is the product too good to be true? That's yes. a real big red flag, That's right? That's a big red flag. Because if they say all these miraculous things are going to happen, yeah. Buyer beware. Buyer beware, indeed. Really. Yeah. Do, you know, realize that red flag and go into these sources and start doing your homework before you purchase because we'd rather you be healthy and well and safe and not spend your money on something right. that will make you sick in any way. Just an interesting point about that. You know, you hear people who are more inclined towards natural products. I find that they're different personalities and some people just really prefer that yeah. and others really seem to trust pharmaceuticals more. But, you know, we, on our, if you watch the TV now, it's hard to watch anything without having four or five different pharmaceutical ads come it's across true. the screen. Yes. And, and that has garnered a fair amount of criticism of like, mm. well, why are we allowed to promote it in this way? There's so much money involved. It's the same with supplements and nutraceuticals. There are, there's huge money involved in yes. this. And so if there's a big commercial promoting something, Buyer beware. Do, you've got to do a little bit more research. So really important. Mm -hmm. Fourth question, is there evidence that the supplement does what it promises? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now when you think about people using supplements for weight loss, right. I mean, some of the supplements tell you you're going to lose 10 pounds in right. just a few days, right? Right, right. Or whatever. So again, be very aware of what it's promising you. Right. So an interesting example of that, it goes back to fish oil, where I'd say 9 out of 10 people are taking fish oil thinking it's going to uh, prevent them from having a heart attack right. down the road. Yeah. There is no evidence, no evidence to support that fish oil is preventive for heart attacks or cardiovascular health. There is evidence that it's useful for other things, and so it can be recommended for other things, and there are times where it still can have great value. But... I think most people are taking it for one reason that's not supported. And some of the fish oils really do not yeah. have... Quality matters. Yes, quality, quality matters. matters. But, so let's take that a little further. Yeah. But people think that 
um, some people think that it's important to eat fish. Yes. To help them to have a healthy lifestyle, and that some people don't like to eat fish. Right. So they think in order to supplement the right. eating of fish, they should take fish oil. Right. So let's talk about that. And that's a good example of why someone would take a supplement is when right. they're not getting something in their diet. Yes. Right. So like I said, there are reasons that could be worthwhile that someone could take a fish oil supplement. However, the research is, shows that getting it dietarily is better for you. And what so, would be the best type of fish? Wild salmon. Wild salmon, not farmed salmon. No. Wild salmon. Wild salmon. Yep. And, and if it doesn't say wild, it's probably not. So, so if you see it, it on a menu and it yeah. just says salmon, it's And, and what farmed. about smoked salmon? If it's wild. If yeah. it's wild, smoked yeah. salmon on the uh, bagel or whatever else yep. is still good. Still good. Twice, eating it twice a week should give you plenty of the benefits that are attributed to omega-3s in that regard. Really? Mm -hmm. Versus taking an omega-3 supplement? Right. So it depends on why we're taking an omega-3 supplement. If we're taking it for heart health, there's no evidence to support that. There are other reasons that it could be beneficial. There's some evidence that it's helpful actually in depression, in ADHD, for dry eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a variety of different reasons above and beyond what I just listed that it, it could be helpful for. Consumerlabs.com great resource for finding that out and finding out which one would be a good one for you to take in terms of brand. Um, but it, yeah, if someone doesn't want to eat fish, then what I like to help people do in my office is say, okay, well, maybe we don't have to jump to fish oil if you don't want to eat fish, depending again on what we're, we'd be using for or why we'd, I'd want someone to have fish in their diet. And we might look to other sources of omega-3s in the diet, maybe walnuts or flax seed or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I might suggest that someone introduce those into their diet if they're really averse to eating fish for some reason. So there still might be ways dietarily that you don't have to take the step up to go to a supplement. So I'm going to just take this a little further since $1.5 billion is spent just on yeah. fish. Besides salmon, what other yeah. fish would be good? Herring? Uh, so herring, yes. People um, often recommend tuna, but I want to just say a caution about yes, tuna because it, of yeah. the high mercury right. content in it. You're um, more and more information about that. Yes. Um, sardines are thought sardines to be a good. good fish. In oil, right? Yep, in oil. In olive oil? Olive oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Preferable to canola oil. Yes. Um, so those are great. So it's you want to do the smaller sort of freshwater fish typically. Uh, once the fish gets bigger, there's more concern about uh, toxicity. So again, to just help our consumers know, other mm -hmm. smaller like shrimp are you talking about? Scallops? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No, because those are shellfish. So um, herring and uh, sole are safe. Tilapia. Mm -hmm. Cod. Those are some better. Cod is good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Things like that. Yes. So that helps them have an assortment mm -hmm. so that they realize they can do this. Yes. But if they yes. don't like fish, they can also have the walnuts. And, yes, flax seeds. And, yeah, that's and other ways options. to go about it. Mm -hmm. And you, you were saying on the fish twice a week. Mm -hmm. Now, what if you're a vegetarian? Yeah, walnuts Is, and flax seeds. Walnuts mm -hmm. and flax seeds. So no need to really have a supplement. Mm -hmm. You can eat walnuts and flax seeds. Yes. Now, to get technical, the, the omega-3s that are in the vegetarian foods, the walnuts and flax seeds, don't necessarily get converted quite as easily to the mm. healthy omega-3 that you get mm. from fish oil. So some people who don't convert that as well, again, depending on why we might want to use fish oil, they might actually benefit from taking a fish oil supplement rather than walnuts or flax seeds. And again, when they choose that fish oil, make sure that they go and really research make it and sure just it's not fresh, do everything. Keep it in the fridge. Yeah, do the right when research. they purchase yep. that too. And that's a hard thing sometimes to know. How long has that fish been sitting? And are you better off getting frozen fish? Oh, for uh, cooking or for yes, supplement? For cooking. Well, I don't know. That's a good question for the grocer, I would say. I'm always wondering that myself when fresh I go to the grocery frozen? store. Well, pre I think fresh is preferable, but yes. I'm always concerned that it's been sitting there for a while. So you have to trust your grocer. And then the interesting yeah. thing is you said if the fish oil is fresh in a supplement. Yes, ah. sometimes it's not. How would you know? Smell it. Yeah, how can you? A lot of these uh, yeah, you tablets can, are you can in cut these it gel open. things. You can cut it open. After you buy it, it cut check, it open. Check the expiration dates, but also some companies, by the time, even within the expiration date, it might have oxidized. So smell it, but, you know, 
These people have done their homework for you, these yeah. other companies. ConsumerLab.com, yep. USP. USP, NSF, they've done the work for you. So mm -hmm. uh, unless you're interested in making your kitchen a chemistry lab, which some people would want to test it themselves, but it'll save you money probably to just check the companies that have been pre-approved. So let's regard. talk about expiration dates. Mm -hmm. Knowing when your vitamins and when your variety of different supplements and pills, prescriptions mm -hmm. and everything else, prescriptions usually have their expiration and date. And most on. supplements that I've seen do, not all, but most, they, yeah, should. they should. It makes me nervous if one doesn't. Right. Yeah. So that's something to really look at. And mm -hmm. is there a beyond time for an expiration date as far as how far you can go? Or when it says that expiration date, that should be it? That should be it. And yeah, I, companies aren't allowed to sell it past their expiration date. Now, one of the things we do know is when it comes to prescriptions, medications that have expired, and it should be the same, I believe, for supplements, mm -hmm. don't put them down your toilets. Don't put them down mm -hmm. your sinks. Right. Each of your local communities have times where you can bring it in, or they now have these lock boxes right. any day, seven days a week, available for you so that you can bring your medications, put it in, no questions asked, and yep. they get rid of them yep. in a, a good fashion so it doesn't affect the environment. Right. So please, audience, know that. That's an important thing. So another question is, do I really need supplements? This is the fifth of the five questions. And if so, am I taking the right amount? Right. Dosing is a huge thing. Dosing is yeah. huge. People are actually overdose on supplements. They do. So yep. talk to us about that. So that's a really important thing. So I find that um, people will go on the internet and they decide they've tried a medication for something like arthritis mm. and they are not getting the relief they want. So then someone will go into their Google search bar and type in natural relief for arthritis. Yes. And ads and everything will pop up. And so then they'll start clicking on things and might find, okay, well, turmeric is supposed to on this website, it says turmeric is useful for arthritis. So they might go and just get turmeric off the shelf in the grocery store, the kind you cook with, and put it in your food. Or you can buy 25 different supplements on the shelf that have different amounts of turmeric in it. So you don't might, advise that, though. I don't no, advise okay. that. I'm just saying, this is what happens. Oh, no. This is what happens. <laughs> no, um, so some people may pull a turmeric off the shelf and it'll say proprietary blends and it has turmeric and black pepper and ginger in it and then they never tell you how much is in there. So you have no idea how much turmeric you're getting. Whereas the studies that show that turmeric is useful, they've studied it on, for example, 500 milligrams of turmeric. So it's important to check. Again, these companies have checked dosing. There is research out there with uh, dosing for certain supplements. But then what about an adult that weighs 180 pounds versus a teenager who weighs 85 pounds, mm -hmm. you know? So you're going to need different doses for those people. And it's, it, this stuff is hard to figure out unless, unless you're experienced with this. But it's just important to be aware of that if you go on Google and it says 500 milligrams of turmeric for arthritis, if you're a really petite person, you might want to consider cutting back on the dose and just being cautious about things like that. Now, turmeric is also a spice. It is a spice. And so when people hear about turmeric is helpful, yep. some of them are sprinkling it into everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then again, yep. how do you know when enough is enough and not too much? Yeah, I know. Wouldn't it be nice if we knew the answer we to that? No. I know. We need to know because yeah. we think we're doing the right things. And turmeric, we could just be sprinkling too much. Right. Turmeric is pretty astringing. So I say if it doesn't taste good at all, you've put too much on there. <laughs> you know, if you taste it and you're like, ugh. That's, that's at least one clue, if not a scientifically validated answer. <laughs> now let's talk about melatonin. <laughs> yep. Because one of the other things that a number of people have is trouble sleeping. Right. Their body changes. Yeah. Um, and, and they have difficulty sleeping. And... Um, we know that there are medications that are out there over the counter and some mm -hmm. pre prescriptions that can really do a number on people also. Right. And so in order for people not to get addicted to that or some of them that have responses to, like there have been reports about Ambien and different things like that, some right. of the counterindications related to what's happened. So melatonin. Yeah. How should we use that? Let what me should we caution people? Let me start by expressing a different caution first, which is if you're having trouble sleeping and it's been chronic, don't start with melatonin. 
Start by going to your doctor. There we go. Get an, you get an exam. <laughs> get yeah. an exam right. and make and sure see. there's not something else going on. Because what could else be going on that sleep would be a portion of that? You know what I see most? Stress. Exactly. Stress is a big factor. It but is. there could be other pathological reasons why someone yeah. could have difficulty sleeping. And so it's important to make sure there's not sleep apnea, things like that. And, you know, have a, have a workup. Make sure there's not something that you're totally missing. And then if you get a clean bill there and you just are having trouble falling asleep, it could be worth trying melatonin. And the doctor would suggest that, wouldn't they? They could. Yeah, yeah they have. I've heard that yeah. happen uh, regularly enough. Now, with any sleep aid, there's concern about taking something too long. Correct. Uh, with Ambien or medications like that, the concern is the direct side effects of that. Yeah. With melatonin, there, some think that if you take too high of a dose, it's going to suppress your own natural production of melatonin, right. which is thought to be potentially problematic. Yes. Melatonin has a pretty decent safety profile when taken within a certain dose range. Um, but at the same time, I, I actually don't recommend it that often. I, know. I don't, yeah. because I'm always looking for, well, why aren't you sleeping exactly. well? Why, it's not a melatonin deficiency, typically. Yes. You know, yeah. it's, is it that you drank too much caffeine, you know, at 7 p.m.? Is that part of the problem? Is it that you're stressed and your mind is racing? Mm -hmm. In which case, melatonin might be a Band-Aid, but it's not necessarily getting to the root of the problem. So I always like to spend time with people saying, well, why are you waking at 3 a.m.? Mm -hmm. And the 3 a.m. wake up, melatonin is not typically that good for that anyway. It tends to be better for people who have trouble falling asleep rather than waking up in the middle of the night. But nevertheless, my preference, personally in my practice, I would try acupuncture, I would try breathing techniques, yes. I'd send them for, to you yes. for a lot of the work you do, the hypnotherapy. Yes. I yeah. think there's so many other things that could be beneficial. Um, I can't even recall the last time I recommended melatonin to yeah. someone. So, well, the energy yeah. work and the qigong and, yeah. and the different types of things can really help. But it's amazing how many people suffer from having difficulty yeah. sleeping. And our society is uh, such. I, I've been one of those people, too. That's yeah. when I'm under stress, sleep is my first system to go. Yeah. And so, Mine, too. Yeah. Yeah, you can see so, it. It happens. Yeah, it, it happens, happens to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a lot of times when we're under stress, it's because we have a lot to get done in a particular day. And so what right. happens is we're getting up very early and we're working till very, very late. We're right. trying to get the most out of a 24-hour day. Right. And, you know, there's so many reports that people across the country in the world don't get enough sleep. Yeah. And they're falling asleep on train stations, you know, at the, sitting in a train or having difficulty staying awake because right. they keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And we are a society that works very hard and doesn't take a lot of vacation, which is right. different from the societies that do. And, and so Balance melatonin, yeah, melatonin just is a Band-Aid, but it's not getting to the root of the problem necessarily. So. You know, it's interesting, too, because some of the supplements that you spoke about of the eight components, mm -hmm. some of the things are ingredients that are listed in tea. Mm -hmm. Ah, mm -hmm. so here we go. So here mm -hmm. we have supplements, yet yep. we have teas that say they also have these things in them. Right. So again, buyer beware. Yeah. Because, again... You don't know what's inside that tea. Right. So let's talk about that. That's a really good point. It so is. teas tend to be less potent. Mm -hmm. When um, I'm working with someone and they have a really sensitive stomach or yes. they say, I react to everything, I'm yeah. so sensitive, that's when I might actually turn to tea because right. they're... It can be soothing, but not every soothing. tea is the same. Exactly. So then again... How do you know which tea is good? Right. I don't know if they have the consumer lab that views the, the tea. No, it's a good point. Anyone who's drank a cup of Smooth Move knows that even a little bit of tea can go a long way. This is and true. That part, yeah, it can, that little bit of herb still has an effect. It does. Yeah. But how should people know the difference if the tea is one of the ways they're trying to get their supplement? Right. I these companies don't review teas. No, they don't. So no, they don't. It's buyer beware. Buyer beware. Mm -hmm. And I know we're 
very fortunate in uh, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. We really are. We have a wonderful place called the Cozy Tea Garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Danielle Baudet is an owner there, and there she has some wonderful teas. Absolutely. I know both of us like to get some tea there, and she really investigates and where she, she literally goes across the world to pick right. the right teas and make sure they have the right ingredients and that right. they're raised properly. So although we don't have a consumerlab.com right. for teas, uh, she would be a good source at she least would be for a good people, resource. Yep. a resource for people to ask questions of and to learn more about tea. Right. So the five questions that you should be asking is, has the product triggered any health warnings or sanctions? Mm -hmm. Has the product been tested by independent labs? Is the product too good to be true? Is there evidence that the supplement does what it promises? And do I really need supplements? Mm -hmm. And if so, am I taking the right amount? Mm -hmm. Now, from the perspective of what people should know, um, additional safety regards, you know, purposes for them and things that, it, have we covered it all or is there more? I want to just add in, be extra cautious with children. They're small. The adult dose is often too much for them. Um, there's, I say, just feed them well, fruits and vegetables, and so be careful of all the sugar that's added into children's supplements. So I, I just, an extra cautionary note about that. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people feel a need to add sugar into everything to mm -hmm. get that sweetness and tasting. And one of the things, I, as you know, I love to make smoothies. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to get your vegetables in mm -hmm. there and your I fruits do too. in there love and smoothies. everything else. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you can get and have delicious food mm -hmm. in a variety of ways and get your vitamins that you need. You can. And it can also be delicious and tasty. And if you need that little bit of sweetness, there is what you add of your fruit. Yeah. Fruit, your fruit in itself. A little bit of raw honey, a little bit of maple syrup. And you don't even yeah. need that with some of the fruits yeah, that you, you combine. It's a chemistry. Mm -hmm. It truly is a chemistry of learning the fruits together right. that really blend together and make it uh, delicious, as well as the vegetables that you can combine. Right. So now we know that there's research out there that can support use. Mm hmm. But we need our consumers to very much take the responsibility yes. to learn what they need to. Yes. Now, you were saying in your naturopathic education that supplements is something that you were really trained on. Yes, yes. Tell was, us about that. Yeah, I will. Um, so we had a fair amount of emphasis around uh, what we're talking about here, making yes. sure that we know what to look for in terms of quality companies, are they getting it reviewed by third party. So just really taking a step back to understand the supplement industry, its many flaws and some of the strengths with, within it and learn to evaluate based on quality and, and figure out what those questions are. So learning to ask these questions is, is a part of that education. But then also learning about herbs. You know, they're not taught in conventional medical schools. So learning what does echinacea do? Why was it used historically? How is it grown? What part of the plant is used typically? Um, is there evidence to support its use? Are there contraindications? When would it be used? When should it not be used? And that's just for one plant. We get that training for many commonly used herbs. And uh, herbs grown in this country, herbs that are used around the world. Same thing, a huge amount of nutrition training, not just in terms of uh, food, but then also what, are, what about adding the macronutrients, things like calcium, magnesium. What about the micronutrients, selenium, zinc, that kind of stuff. When are they indicated to look for a deficiency? What does that deficiency look like in someone? When would supplementation be warranted? How long do you supplement for? What's the dose you go to? So. It's a lot of training. It's that, very interesting yeah. because in the regular um, allopathic curriculum, mm -hmm. they don't have that mm -mm. that's given to them. No, nope. so, and that's why we can work together well and learn from each other. Exactly. Ideally. Yeah. Exactly, because they yeah. now, from a prescription medication point mm -hmm. of view, do you get that training and understanding that as well? There's some. We don't get as much as medical doctors. Yes, yeah. and the pharmacist is the really one that is mm -hmm. educated related to prescriptions, and mm -hmm. I always advise people, 
Yeah, there's some wonderful pharmacists, and I tell them, bring your list of prescriptions, have them review it with you, mm -hmm. and find out if there are any contraindications. I know for some of my clients, we have found out yeah. some contraindications that have explained some of the symptoms that they've been going through because right? of that mix that nobody knew about because right. they were going to different doctors prescribing different things. And, and it's important to look at the as you pointed out before, the combination of maybe an herbal medicine with a pharmaceutical medicine. Correct. An example is St. John's wort is an herb that's used often for depression. depression. Yes. But it interferes with things like antibiotics, birth control pills. I have a cousin because... Um, I have an additional cousin because, <laughs> <laughs> because his mother wasn't aware that taking St. John's wort would affect the efficacy of her birth control pills. Really? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a very interesting point. Are there mm -hmm. any other things like that that people should know? Well, that's one of the most common ones. I mean, all of these things have interactions that they we do. need to be careful. And St. John's where is known. I mean, grapefruit juice, right. we know, is very similar reasons that you're not supposed to take that with tell your medications. Tell us the audience about that. Why? With grapefruit juice, well, similarly to St. John's where it increases your metabolism of the pharmaceutical. So you might not be have a sufficient dose to help with your blood pressure, for instance. You might metabolize it too quickly, so then you no longer, you don't have the appropriate dose in your so, bloodstream. And how would grapefruit or grapefruit juice be helpful for people in a natural so, way? If you think, well, it's supporting the liver in detoxification, right. which is a good thing yeah. in general, yeah. but if, if you're on a dose that was set for you at your maybe less good ability to detox, then you might suddenly require a different dose. So on its own, it's, that's cool that grapefruit juice does that, that it supports the liver in increasing metabolism. Yeah. Um, a useful thing in and of its own to help when we're exposed to things in our environment, right. um, but it throws things off when you're trying to keep things at even levels in terms of dosage. Now, a very interesting thing recently um, was shown on public television that mm -hmm. was done by Frontline, mm -hmm. and it's called The Supplements and Their Safety. Mm -hmm. And I'd highly recommend for the listening audience and the viewing audience to go to that website and click it on. It's on YouTube, it, it's easily it's accessible. Good. You'll see at the end of this show that that will come up for you so that you know how to get to that. What was your impression of the show? I'm glad you asked. I thought it was very good and it's very useful and it raises very important awareness really about good. this industry. And there, there are a lot of weak points in the supplement industry mm. that need to be exposed and we need to address it. What I didn't care for with the show is that they didn't tell the consumer, here's what you do, uh, here's how you find better information. And that's what we did today. Uh, yeah, you sort we of, made sure we got that for I, I feel like someone could watch this show and be like, I'm never taking another supplement again in my life, right. which could be fine. Which could be a Absolutely good thing. Absolutely <laughs> could be a good and thing. And they would say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to get great food. And, and that would be better. And that's what I we agree. would want. And then, but I, I don't want people to walk away with the impression that all supplement companies are bad and every single supplement out there is contraindicated and terrible because there are some good ones that are worthwhile in certain times and places, but not all the time. Start with diet, start with lifestyle, start with exercise, those things. So uh, let's just go to diet. Mm -hmm. if we, the best things for people to eat? Vegetables. Vegetables. Yeah. Any particular ones that are your favorite oh recommendations gosh. that you tell people? I love the cruciferous family. The tell the people what broccoli, that broccoli, cauliflower, kale, and cabbage. Okay. Uh, I just recommended that today to a patient who, on lab testing, it showed that she had excess estrogen, for instance. Um, she, her estrogen was above the normal range at, for the time in her cycle that it should have been. And she was having symptoms. She would get severe acne, mm -hmm. and she would get uh, terrible cramps before her menstrual cycle. And she was pretty uncomfortable and was really tired of this. So the cruciferous family, the broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and kales, they help with the metabolism of estrogen, which is so cool. You can also buy um, a supplement that has broccoli extract in it, but my preference would be just eat the broccoli. Eat fresh you know, broccoli. eat the broccoli, eat yeah. the cauliflower. It's so good. It is. And um, if for some reason you're highly averse to it, there are there might be a good supplement out there for you for and that to, purpose. And but to check. And then you check these things, but so on, that's not where I would want to start. So on the broccoli, the cauliflower, mm -hmm. the kale, 
Best ways to know that they're fresh and good. Oh. To pick them. And do, do you have any preference, raw or steamed? I don't care for raw broccoli. Okay. I prefer mine steamed. Okay. That's my personal preference. Okay. Um, I just look to make sure it doesn't have brown spots or that it's turned yellow mm -hmm. in spots. And right. um, I just look closely at it to see. One if of the it things looks people fresh. do with their vegetables also is they overcook them. Yes, they do. They overcook yeah. them so they're taking out all the nutrients. Right. So for broccoli. You said you steam them. I steam mine for about a minute and a half to two minutes. So That's it's still it. got a little bit of crunch, yep. but it's it becomes a brighter green. Yes. And, but it's soft enough to chew. And what do you believe about people who microwave their food? Hmm, microwave that's their That's a vegetables. good question. Yes. I know that's a debate about a debate. the loss of nutrients mm. in microwaving. Mm. I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't have a microwave personally at home. I don't, mm. I don't care for them, especially in terms of you don't want to microwave things in plastic. That right. has been shown for sure right. that you increase the uh, components of plastic in they your recommend food. If you're going to microwave, microwave in glass mm -hmm. or microwavable mm -hmm. dishes and I say, you know, if you have no alternative and you need to heat up your lunch, by all means, go for it. But mm. if you have, it's it's really easy to just have a steamer tray at home and it yes, takes it two minutes. It does. So I think just learning a few basic culinary techniques, you'll yeah. find that you don't need your microwave you nearly as much. You about a steamer tray. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by a steamer tray? Good Versus question. Versus the so, pot with the thing with the steamer. Well, well that works too, <laughs> but a steamer tray, um, it's a metal tray that has these uh, leaflets that fold up over it, but they can fold down so that they fit in a variety of different sized pots. Okay. And they have holes in it so that the steam uh, from the boiled water will come up through the holes and right. steam the vegetables. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So we're talking about the same thing, but I've never heard it referred to as a What do you call tray. yours? I don't know. I just use it. I <laughs> it flips out like an open flower. Yeah. And you put it in and it closes up. And exactly. it steams and it's done and it's delicious. Right. Other foods. And it's still always too hot when you reach in. And to very get it. hot. Yeah, it's you have to hot. Take, I use yeah, it on a ticket careful. fork or yeah, whatever and exactly. pull it out and put it down and then right. it's wonderful. So we talked about the, the kales, the cauliflower, mm -hmm. and the broccoli. Again, so as a balance. I'm whatever. a big fan of that family of vegetables. Okay. The greens, lettuces, spinach, all those wonderful things. Um, okay. And then the... I, uh, eat a rainbow. So we've got peppers, tomatoes, and then the orange. We've got carrots and squashes are so fantastic. Mm. Um, there's purple cabbage, which when you steam it will turn your water blue. It's amazing. Yes. So just eat a rainbow in terms of colors. And, and then we then have the, the Dirty Dozen list. Oh, the Dirty Dozen. It's a perfect yes. time to, because we're looking yes. at supplements okay. on what not to do, but right. let's talk about the Dirty Dozen list. It's a good point. So the Dirty Dozen list is the list of the 12 uh, vegetables and fruits mm -hmm. that have the highest residue for pesticides Correct. on it, Yes. which is a concern because it if is. you're eating those every day, these things bioaccumulate. What yes. I mean by that is they're fat soluble, so they tend to be stored right. and they tend to be problematic. Exactly. We're starting to have research come out that's showing that these have detrimental effects on our health. Yes. So in terms of people say, well, should I eat all organic or not? It's expensive to eat organic, which is typically the complaint or mm -hmm. it's hard to find. I say, look at that list of the dirty dozen. If those are foods that you eat all the time, be careful and start to choose organic for the foods that are on that list. Apples typically are at the top of that list. They are. So organic apples, I'd highly recommend. And then you look at, there's a list called the Clean 15, and that's the produce that has the lowest pesticide residue. So if you want to save your money, you uh, buy more in that category, and you don't have to choose organic as much. There's a great co website, ewg.com. Yes, yes. I always like dot to org. recommend dot org. Dot, dot org. Thank mm -hmm. you for the correction. ewg.org. Yeah. ewg.org. It's a great one because yep. not only do they have you know, the good foods, the dirty dozen, right. the clean foods and everything else. But they tell you a variety of things that you can look up and be aware of. And Absolutely. Which fish is good for you? What skincare products are oh safe goodness. for you? Yes, it's... and environmentally, what to be aware of, right. what not to do. And, and it really helps to educate it's us. It's an excellent website. There's so many ways that we can be educated to make positive choices. And the interesting thing is, I mean, just imagine... $30 billion mm -hmm. of an industry, it's billions not of regulated. dollars every year being spent on supplements that are not regulated, mm -hmm. which means there is no oversight whatsoever. 
Well, that's, that's where these third parties come in, and they're doing us a great service. They are. Mm -hmm. So I would like you to show to the audience again and into the camera the labels that you should look for. Consumerlabs.com, great website, $39 for an annual fee. And in that fee, you can have the opportunity to delve in and get whatever information that you need related Lots to Lots of comparison. research about effectiveness, safety, dosing, products that are tested and considered safe or not safe. And they also have a free newsletter. Mm -hmm. United States Pharmacopeia, USP. Um, it, this is an independent, not-for-profit company that tests products to make sure that what's in the label or on the label is actually what's in the product and at the appropriate dose. NSF, very similar to USP, uh, tests independently to make sure that these products are safe and have in them what they say they do. And remember to read labels. Mm -hmm. Validate their safety by checking out these resources. Mm -hmm. Know what it is that's in the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Really look to make sure. And know why you're taking something. Again, the fish oil heart disease thing is a, it's so interesting. Everyone thinks they're taking it to prevent heart attacks, and that's just not validated. And so, the five questions yep. to ask. Has the product triggered any health warnings or sanctions? Has the product been tested by independent labs? Is the product too good to be true? Is there evidence that the supplement does what it promises? And do I really need supplements? Ask yourself that. And if so, am I taking the right amount? And remember, the most important thing that you can do is eat healthy. Take the money instead of spending it on supplements unless your doctor tells you that that is something that you need to do. Spend it on good healthy food mm -hmm. and learn how to make it and use it in combination so that it will help you to be vibrant. And of course, exercise and get good sleep. And if you're having trouble sleeping, instead of automatically going to a drug or a supplement, find out what is causing your sleep loss. And when it comes to weight loss, don't look to a Pull, pill to get rid of your weight because that is not what's going to change your lifestyle. Mm -mm. It's a matter of good exercise, eating well, sleeping well, drinking mm. plenty of water, and making sure, of course, that the water source that you're drinking from is clean and good. Our show is all about informing you in the very best possible way that we can about information to empower you, to keep you healthy and well and happy. Please go to info at YCD Holistic Healing if you have any questions or have any topics that you would like us to address. In the meantime, stay healthy, be well, take excellent care of yourself, and thank you so much for this information. We'll see you next time. The preceding program.